Those are Senate candidates. Then as representatives for District 14A is Eric Putnam and Tamara B, Zachary Dorholt, and Jim Knobloch. Got that right, didn't I? Let's see, this forum will end at 4.30 or when all questions have been answered. Audience members, you are invited to write questions on the note cards. These will be collected and then sorted by the screeners. Please pass your cards on to the end of the row or hand them to the people who are collecting them and they will be walking around. If multiple questions are submitted which pertain to the same issue, the screeners will determine which ones capture your concerns clearly and succinctly. Candidates, you will each be allowed the following amounts of time. One minute for an opening statement about why you're running and your qualifications for the office. One and one half minutes to answer each question from the audience, and one minute for a closing statement at the end of the questions and answer period. The timekeeper will hold up cards. 30 seconds means you have 30 seconds left. Time means finish your sentence and stop. And I have a gavel here, so don't make me use it. I will begin by asking, let me see, Jay Wolf for his opening statement.
for them, you're voting for that party, not the candidate. The last reason I'm running is because people who don't have voices, they deserve to have voices. For example, my wife is in the second row, Lily. Uh, she just came from Indonesia, and she needs to have a voice whether or not she can vote. And there's millions of that, people like that in our community, and that's why I'm running. Okay. Next, we're going to uh, Senate District or Legislative District 14A, Eric Putnam. My name is Eric Putnam. Uh, I've lived in Minnesota now for 20 years. Uh, I've lived in St. Cloud for 10. And in the past 10 years, I've become very much involved in our community as a volunteer at Thomas Neighborhood, where I also serve on the board of directors, as a volunteer in some uh, other uh, nonprofits that I, that I work with that are just getting started. And as a volunteer in the public school district. So when you think of that guy who goes to kindergarten every week and counts beans with your kid, that was me. I did that. I also coached the academic triathlon teams and did those kinds of activities in school. And with all my involvement in the schools, I've come to realize just how wonderful this community is and how desperately it needs strong advocacy. You know, I visited the, um, the, the Capitol uh, a few weeks ago and I saw that people were arguing, not just as Democrats versus Republicans, but as Metro versus outstate. And to me, that's problematic, because we are neither. We aren't Foley, and we aren't North Minneapolis. And because of that, we're, we're sort of left in the middle and not getting the attention that we deserve. So I'm running to represent that uh, community. I, I bring my skills as a professor of communication at St. John's to bear in that task. Next, we have Tamla Tice. Thank you, and thanks for everybody showing up today. I'm Tamma Tice. I'm the state representative for District 428. I'm running for my third term. And the reason I got involved was that as a business owner and belonging to several different groups, namely the Central Minnesota Builders Association and the Chamber of Commerce, I would take the opportunities to go lobby with the rest of them for what my concerns were. And I learned really quickly that if nobody else does it, it doesn't get done. And with that, I just decided that, you know, why not me? And so when, when uh, the opportunity arose, I decided to throw my hat in the ring. As far as what I'm qualified, why I'm qualified to do it is I've sat on many different boards in this area. Greg and I have been in St. Cloud for 36 years, owned businesses, uh, I've worked with the kids in school. I started out in kindergarten until uh, they basically said, we don't want you here anymore, which was about fifth grade. Um, I've been with Birthline, Central Minnesota Builders Association, and others. Thank you. Next is Zachary Dorholt in District 14B. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Zachary Dorholt. Thanks for coming out on this gorgeous fall afternoon to join us in a uh, conversation. Um, I live over in that corner, and it helps remind me of uh, why I'm running. I used to chair the campaign for Larry Haas and who is a champion of somebody who we often spoke of, of people who live in, in the shadows of life. I'm a mental health professional. I work at a nonprofit mental health center where I work with many folks who have been disenfranchised from, and who, from all walks of life. I'm a father. I have two daughters, uh, age two and four, and I know already they're not likely to have as great of a K-12 education as I had. Class sizes are bigger, and more complicated. Um, also running um, because most of you are probably really sick and tired of the extraordinary amount of outside money invading our community and disenfranchising people from becoming part of the democratic process and it's time for campaign finance reform now. Okay, and lastly is Jim Knobloch from 14B. Well, thank you very much. Well, welcome everyone. Thanks for coming today. Um, I was uh, born and raised on the north side of St. Cloud, really not too far from here. I grew up in the corner of 27th Avenue and 10th Street. Went to Madison, north of Apollo. I uh, was fortunate to go on and uh, get a degree in business at St. John's and later an MBA and a master's in government. I'm a small business owner in town with a real estate business, married, have two children, and I'm running to give back to the community. I am the current state representative in 14B. I was in for six terms back in the 90s and 2000s, uh, got elected again in 2014, and I'm pleased to be able to be someone at the legislature who can work with both sides to get things done. 
I was the author this year of the only major finance bill that got passed into law, the Supplemental Finance Bill, uh, which was my job to carry as chair of the Ways and Means Committee. And so I'm someone that can get things done with both sides, and I have a demonstrated history of accomplishing things. In fact, the Pioneer Press named me as being the most independent, bipartisan Republican of any other Republican down there for the last two years, a demonstration of my ability to work with both sides. Thank you. Okay, now we're going to start, and I should let you know, too, that this series is being uh, videotaped by the City of St. Cloud and audio taped by NPR, just to let you know that. And I'm going to start with our first question, and these are going to come randomly according to my chart. The first question is from the Whitney Senior Center sponsor. We are inundated with unsolicited emails, text messages, and telephone calls from people marketing and also seeking to scam or commit fraud. Older adults have been targeted heavily and suffered great financial loss. What would you do to bring back personal privacy to Minnesota citizens? And we're going to start this with Zachary Dorholt. Thanks for that question. It's very significant, having recently been uh, subjected to one of these scam calls myself. I can, through my cell phone, uh, fake IRS folks. And many of you probably have seen them. Uh, zip code, is there area codes coming from Washington or DC? They tell you who you're with, and they say uh, you're, you're getting uh, filed a lawsuit against you. And they're calling their cell phones, they're calling their home phones, they're sending you emails. And what we have done, and I've strongly supported throughout the, the recent past when I was a legislator, is helping streamline this reporting process through um, our Attorney General's office, Lori Swanson. Um, it, it, we need that to be much more robust. It can't just be a small office. And this is where government does play a role uh, through the Attorney General's office. I think our Attorney General Lori Swanson does a great job on prosecuting these folks. But it's going to take some team effort um, throughout many different states because many people have been victims of this, uh, not just in Minnesota, but elsewhere. So we need to start working with others, um, whether it be Wisconsin, North Dakota, and the federal government to do this. And that means fully funding, yes, part of the government. Um, that being the Attorney General's office, and making sure that everybody here has more than just a 1 800 hotline or an email to report this, but maybe we can localize these efforts here. Maybe we can team up the AG office with the City of St. Cloud office and so on. Um, there's not enough of this to, to report these things right now. Okay, next is Jerry Ralph. Thank you. To me, the issue is one. I think to me, the issue is the one that involves education. People need to be aware of what's going on. And I certainly support programs. Uh, the Attorney General's office is one place that this can be done. But I think we can have programs that will help educate people. The whole issue of cybersecurity is going to just grow and grow and grow. And I think that we need to study means and methods for making them be more secure in the transactions that they do online, having more security in dealing with people, and just having people educated that, that this IRS scam is one that's been around for a while. Uh, I've received calls on it that this is your last and final notice that you will be taken to court. Well, the idea here is, is that people are aware of this. If they're, if they're educated, then they can be armed and be able to deal with it. So I would support programs through uh, the, the Attorney General and also in, through general education to help people to understand what the threats are that are out there and the things that can be done for that. I would also support a hotline to a central processing location that will deal with these complaints. Right now, people don't know where to go with the complaints. And I would support creating a place that they can go to and, and register the complaint and have it effectively looked into. Okay, Tamla Tice is next. Having seen this happen to um, actually the mother of my sister-in-law, it's really scary how much information folks know when they call. Um, her name is Bobby, had gotten a phone call 
and they used her grandson's name. So this is this is Adam in Mexico. I mean, it was just a really far-fetched story, but Bobby at least knew enough to hang up basically and call her daughter-in-law and say, "Hey, I just got this phone call. Where's Adam at? He was in St. Paul, so he wasn't in Mexico." So I think the biggest gift we give each other is just the information and education. Trying to find ways to get a better message out if it's not happening now. I think it is, but I don't think people really take something like this as seriously as it can be. And another piece of information that we've been really trying to get out too is don't give away your numbers. Don't give away your information, your banking information, your social security numbers. Those are all really important. And as was talked about just now, you know, we really need to have a place for people to go to say, hey, this happened to me. You know, I'm not really sure. Uh, I'd have to check with Chief Anderson to see if they have something set up here in St. Cloud. But just something where folks, where folks can call and say, hey, this is what happened to me. Because it's really scary, the information this person knew about uh, my nephew. And yes, you know, so many folks are on Facebook. Everybody's connected. We do all this stuff. We do put it out there. But I think we also need to be very cognizant of what information is okay and what isn't. Okay, next is Stephen Silver. <laughs> this might be the first time I agree with Jerry on a lot of things. <laughs> and that's surprising. Uh, it's that education is the key since the majority of these scams, the person is outside the U.S., like Nigeria. Now you setting up a hotline is great, you setting up a location where you have funds that can investigate, but they're in Nigeria, you can't do much about that. Which means educating is one of the only keys. Make sure, uh, you know, not only the youth, but everyone older than the youth know how to use a phone, how to use the internet, what to do or not to do with a credit card, and so forth. Uh, that's the number one issue is education, uh, making more programs to people that are technologically so they can get more savvy with it. Otherwise, if we don't do that, uh, it's gonna keep going and going, and no matter how much money we spend, it won't help because we can't extradite someone in Nigeria. Uh, next is Eric Putnam. So the, the speed at which information is traveling nowadays is absolutely terrifying. It's not the existence of the information, it's how accessible it is and how anyone can access it anywhere. And how as soon as we master one technology that's oppressing us, a new one pops up. Uh, I think about this when I think of my college students. I used to pretend to be out of touch. Now I'm just am. <laughs> and the technology speeds up so quickly. And it seems like they're the only ones who know how these things work, and in five years they won't. And this is so problematic because with this rapid change comes a crisis of faith. We're not sure that we can trust these technologies that are supposed to be connecting us with our loved ones. And that trust is something I think that needs to be rebuilt. And so I agree with uh, virtually everything that everyone has said at this point. To me, the answer has to be education. It has to be a very particular kind of education, though. I can envision um, something concrete, like actually having college students, having millennials come here as interns. I could arrange that at St. John's, in fact, and they would be ecstatic. Have them actually come do public service projects where we work on educating seniors and everyone, frankly, and I, if, if folks who need to learn about technology would include me, um, educating us about you know, the, the dangers and the remedies to information online. Uh, so I'd like to see that kind of work where we, we, we have affordable, reliable, reasonable, very local ways of increasing community and faith around the technologies that connect. Jim Knobloch. Well, thank you. It's interesting. I think everyone has had this experience. I've had that IRS call, too. My wife has had her credit card scammed a couple times for travel. I've had some other product calls, and I'm pretty sure were scam calls, too. Uh, so, yeah, this is just pervasive, and it is a real problem. And I think particularly, you know, they try to prey on uh, seniors, and it's a good question that you're asking. You know, as to what to do about it, uh, I just, I have... Having been down to the legislature as a state representative for the last two years, having chaired the Ways and Means Committee, which deal with budgets, I have never had Attorney General Swanson come to me and say, uh, we need more money for this particular initiative. If she did, you know, I'd certainly listen to her. But uh, people should know this is not a small office. There are hundreds and hundreds of employees in the Attorney General's office. 
I think there's some hundreds of attorneys in the Attorney General's office, and she's got a lot to do. If she comes forward and says, I've got an initiative, I certainly listen to her, but I have never uh, had any sort of uh, contact with her saying that uh, she wants something. One thing that I think we can do, however, is beef up some of the penalties more. Now, we already did this actually for identity theft this last year. It was amazing. The identity theft statute had a statute of limitations of only three years. If you didn't bring the person to trial three years after the crime was committed, you couldn't. And the penalties were such that uh, they were very modest compared to, say, stealing a car, even though the damages, the monetary damages, could be much, much more than stealing a car. And so I think these sort of more white-collar crimes have to be made more equivalent to other crimes. So that we either A, get those people off the street, or B, have penalties that help deter them. Okay. And uh, finally, Ben Wolgamon. Well, similar to Representative Tice, um, I recently had a family member um, fall victim to one of these scams. And it is so frustrating and devastating and violating. And uh, we have to do everything we can, both at a preventative level and an enforcement level, um, to protect our, our seniors and other victims of such fraudulent crimes. Um, absolutely, on the preventative side, um, I agree with what's been said about um, education and awareness and um, you know, working with you know, places like Whitney and, and other uh, centers throughout the community um, for the prevention aspects to prevent such things from happening. But unfortunately, as what happens all too often, um, when people do fall victim to these things, uh, we need to have uh, funding in place and resources in place so that uh, the victims are able to recoup the money and the property that is lost. Um, and this is one of many things, and hopefully we'll get the, the opportunity to talk about this more, but by, uh, by 2020, we will have as many uh, seniors living in the state of Minnesota as we do school children, um, and what's referred to as the silver tsunami. So we have to make sure on all levels um, that we have policies that are, are supporting our seniors and the needs that arise with that. Okay, thank you. Now I think we're ready for our next question, which is from the St. Cloud Area Human Service Council. Minnesota has one of the lowest rates of medically uninsured, but many are struggling with rising costs. Give two examples of how you would work across the aisle to make health care more affordable. And we're going to start this one with Eric Putnam. Clearly, healthcare costs are astronomical and terrifying. There's actually a corollary to college tuitions that have in some ways, and that people don't think a human's going to pay it, so they raise the prices as much as possible. So something substantial has to be done to healthcare costs. Um, we know this in, in so many ways, that how it affects the economy, how it affects our, our public life, how it affects our just general happiness. The economy works better when people are healthy, and they're able to go to work. So we need to find a way to lower prices and increase availability of insurance. I think one of the, uh, again, another corollary to university contexts is I think we suffer tremendous administrative bloat. Uh, the increase in the number of uh, medical hospital administrators, I think, is something like 60% in the last 20 years. And administrators are a lot more expensive, and that drives up the cost of actually doing medicine. Um, I think that that's a substantial problem in something should be fixed or addressed in some fashion. So that would be uh, uh, solution number one. Second is I think we need to work on the cost of prescription drugs. We need to work on actually decreasing the costs of things. In addition to increasing our access through insurance, we need to work more and more deliberately and more thoroughly on negotiating lower prices so that the actual services themselves cost less in addition to the availability of insurance. Mr. Nodluck. Well, thank you. You know, this really gets home to me as I go out door knocking. There was a woman in her 50s, not too far from here, who was retired that I talked to. She was on insure. She was single. She was paying over $1,000 a month for her health insurance, and she had an $8,000 deductible. And, you know, you, you know, presumably she had some reasons that she really felt she had to have uh, health insurance as opposed to just uh, paying the penalty that you could pay right now. And I think everyone should have health insurance. But, you know, MNsure has been an unmitigated disaster. And uh, 
You know, this is a difference between my opponent and I. Uh, Zach, when he was in the legislature, voted to establish Minsure, uh, but it has been a disaster. We've spent over $300 million on the website and trying to get the thing off the ground. It's still not working. You know, what can we do? One thing I would say is we should scrap Minsure and do what a lot of other states have done and just go to the federal program, Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act. I mean, it's already there. It is working in other states. Why are we spending all kinds of money here to uh, reinvent the wheel? Uh, let's just use what's already out there. Secondly, we need more competition. Minnesota is one of only a couple states that says that no for-profit companies can sell health insurance in Minnesota, and yet the largest health insurance company in the country, United Healthcare, is based in Minnesota. Why not let them sell health insurance here? Now, yeah, they're for profit, but if you yeah, don't like their policies, don't buy their policies. It would give you more choice, it would give you more competition, and I think it would help drive down health care costs. Next is Jerry Ralph. Well, the, the whole problem with Minsure, as, as Jim has alluded to, is that it's broken. But the question, I think, was addressed to how I would work across the aisle to try and improve it. So I'm going to address that for just a moment. Part of my Life has been spent in working with me. As an attorney, I represent people from all walks of life. And in order to function in that, you have to build relationships. And I believe that that's what we need to do in the legislature. As I, I will devote my time to trying to build relationships both within the party and across party lines. I think that's important because once you do that, if you gain trust, then you can accomplish things. And I think that's one of the primary objectives that I would have in going down to the legislature in terms of trying to cure this gridlock and cure the partisanship. A couple of quick thoughts. One of the unintended consequences of the, of the old Obamacare program was these high deductibles. It used to be people were not going without health care. They just didn't have health insurance. And the medical system, the system of delivery, delivered the health care. So that simply got eaten in and built into the system. Now what happens is people go in, they get their care, they turn it over to their insurance, and they get this huge bill that they can't pay. What happens? The hospital or the care provider eats the cost. So we, we really haven't gone anywhere. So we need to look at this very closely to try and fix what is broken. And now Mr. Walkamont? Uh, Health care is a very important issue to our community and as well to our family. Um, my wife, Nicole, uh, worked for many years at uh, Mid-Minnesota Legal Aid as a uh, health care outreach paralegal. So, um, well, you know, every day we see experiences of how important it is uh, to have good quality health insurance and how scary it is um, to not have that. So um, certainly, uh, we've got to do everything we can to work together to make health insurance more affordable and more accessible for families. Um, you know, through Minsure and through the Affordable Care Act, uh, there are tax credits available to help uh, offset the costs of, of health insurance for those who can't afford it. And that's one thing I'd be very open to um, working across the aisle um, with Republicans and, um, and putting more resources towards those tax credits. Um, you know, to scrap Minsure and go to that uh, one-size-fits-all throughout the country um, type of health exchange uh, is not in our best interest, um, but absolutely, we've got to do everything we can to work together and, and make health insurance more affordable and more accessible. Mr. Silver. I think most of the people on this table and that table miss the whole problem. Uh, an, an example are soldiers with PTSD, especially in Minnesota. They come back, the health care is crap, the system is crap, and they don't know how to fix or at least make it so the trauma they have goes away. For example, we have marijuana pills. They don't do anything for those soldiers. We found that marijuana, and if a soldier uses it once per day, the PTS uh, the treatments actually are better. The symptoms go away. Cancer is actually goes away and it cures cancer. The problem is our system likes to regulate and control the medicine you put in your body. It's your choice. It's not the system's choice or the state of Minnesota to tell you what to put in your body. 
It's your rights. If you want to put whatever you, in your body, go right ahead. Your body, not mine. And the second problem, if you look at medicinal uh, herbs and supplements, the state of Minnesota banned them, a lot of them. There's a pill in Thailand that you can get here, uh, which is basically uh, our herbal supplement, kind of like marijuana, and it's illegal. You can't use it anywhere in the country, even in Minnesota, and it's supposed to cure a lot of things. Uh, I don't think that's right. And the second, uh, third problem uh, is that I do agree uh, that we need some kind of universal health care like Canada, which are low cost, and you get what you need. It's the state of Minnesota's, uh, you know, I would say right that they give us what we need and we don't pay a lot. <coughs> Ms. Tice. It's hard when you're at the end because yeah. you hear so many ideas and you're like, yeah, I agree with a lot of this. <laughs> and, and what I have written down is, is a lot of what you've heard. But when you look at Minnesota and our the amount of folks we had insured before we started the ACA or Minsure, we were doing a really good job of having people insured. We really haven't changed that number a whole lot, but yet the rates are really going up. What I wish we would have done is looked at models like Minnesota and said, this is what we need to do. What we had going was working a lot better than what we do now. And I say that because on the Commerce Committee, which I sit, we've had the opportunity to have some testimony about uh, the effects of, of having Minsure in our system and what's been going wrong. And it's really scary. It's really scary when a father and son should come and tell you how, um, why their, their mom died because they thought they were insured and they found out they weren't. Those are the issues we're seeing a lot. My son and his wife thought they were insured. He went to the doctor and found out he wasn't. He had a card, all that kind of stuff. Those are the things that are happening. And that's scary and we can't let that happen. So. Really, I think we need more competition. We, that really makes a big difference in the products that we see offered and keeping the price down. And also, you know, love it or hate it, Minsure isn't working. And the amount of money we still have to put into it to get it up and running is a lot. The counties are having a huge cost because they have to have more people there to help people, the navigators to help people go through. It's not convenient. It's not doable. And sometimes they're just not even insured after going through all the work. And we're going to end this question with uh, Mr. Dorholt. Uh, thanks, Ken. Um, if, if you like it, it, there's a small chance for 201 legislators, I would be the only healthcare professional who act actively working in the field. I'm a licensed professional clinical counselor. Uh, every single day, I write insurance, prior authorizations, or reauthorizations that quite often they they own it. They take away time from the time you need to spend with the clients. This is supposed to be about health care. The other part of the question is how do we work across the aisle? Okay, since I live this, this is my career. Work across the aisle. Um, number one, we stop the spin. Minsure is not insurance. Minsure is in exchange for private insurance companies. Okay? We have to stick to the facts. And it is the private insurance companies who are raising their rates. And it is nonprofits like where I work and amazing healthcare systems like the St. Paul Hospital who are working incredibly hard at reducing their costs. So if you look at a recent Wall Street Journal article, not a liberal paper here, they will point out how most healthcare costs of things that are needed have actually gone down. But private healthcare insurance companies are raising their rates. Uh, we can stop this, something I reach across the aisle, I support some tort reform and other types of regulation that we can work on. And I look forward to, to getting back to being an actual healthcare professional, uh, which we desperately need in St. Paul. Thank you. Now we have um, the last of our sponsors' questions. This one is from the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits. What is your view of the nonprofit sector? What is its value to the community? We're going to start this one with Ms. Tice. Wow. Hard being number one. Hard being one, hard being seven. 
It is. <laughs> it really is. Um, I've worked with several different nonprofits, and the value I see is basically bringing issues to the front that no one else is taking care of. Um, you know, just looking around here, I'm looking at some of the folks and the initi initiatives that, that they bring forward. Um, it's really astounding the amount of work that they do. And every year, we see in our offices a lot of folks advocating for the issues we probably don't even get enough time to do justice to. And so what I appreciate in working with nonprofits is not only do you get to see a, probably a better picture of what's really happening and who's, who's it affecting and what's involved, but I really believe that they represent what the community needs. And so, again, sitting on nonprofits, I mean, that's what we did. We advocated for what we believed our community needed. They're doing a great job. And I think every one of us would tell you that we wish we could do a heck of a lot more to help them on their journey. <coughs> sometimes we can do it and sometimes we can't, just because of the, the amount of money coming in or what, what our priorities are. And when you look constitutionally at what we need to do, we need to make sure that gets covered first. I'm always grateful, having been a part of so many different organizations, that we do have people out here who are willing to do the work. They have an important part in bringing people together and making sure that everybody participates in the issues that really face our community. And next is Mr. Putnam. Sorry, second too. I'm still thinking. Okay, fine. <laughs> so uh, uh, nonprofits are very near and dear to my heart. In fact, that's one of the reasons why I'm actually getting uh, in the politics business in the first place is seeing the capacity and potential that nonprofits have not just to raise issues, but to solve problems that the legislature isn't solving. And to solve them in ways that we don't typically consider. So for example, I mentioned earlier that I work with uh, Promise Neighborhood, that I sit on the board. One of the nice things about Promise Neighborhood, how many of you are pretty familiar with Promise Neighborhood, I think, correct? Yeah? One of the, Promise Neighborhood in Tlaib, uh, the Tlaib area. Uh, one of the fascinating things about that organization is its fundamental model is, it's called a continuous loop model. And that means everyone who sits on the board gets to work. No one is too happy or too sad. No one is too wealthy or too poor. We're all there to do the same work together, unified in our commitment to the community. Every member of the board gardens. Every member of the board volunteers there in some capacity. I teach a class there every Wednesday on writing for self-expression and social justice. And uh, that's just something that we do there. And everyone's involved in the same problem at the same time. There's something about nonprofits that I think is absolutely beautiful, not just in solving problems, but also as a model of democracy. That's what our community can be and needs to be. But I think the legislature's not doing nearly enough to help our nonprofits. When we think of how many startup nonprofits we have in this area, how they could be helped by an organization like the CDC that we used to have here, an organization that takes care of accounting issues for multiple nonprofits simultaneously. Startup nonprofits all share a lot of the same problems. I think the legislature could help those nonprofits with those problems. Okay, Mr. Dorgold. Nonprofit, we'll keep hearing words. I mentioned I work at a nonprofit. Um, <laughs> So, and a good plug for the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits. You know, if you go to their website, they have all the tools necessary to start a nonprofit right there. If you want to use the website and print out and sign some forms, you can pretty much start your own nonprofit with all the information they have on their website. I've done that twice. Um, one, I, I helped uh, start what's called the Central Minnesota Sustainability Project, and we help basically uh, help facilitate bringing, uh, accessing land to people who don't have access to land so they can grow their own healthy food. Um, many of you might be familiar with the Main Prairie uh, Garden uh, across the, the road from a um, big, large uh, apartment complexes, many of which people live there obviously don't have access to their own land, yet they're amazing, amazing growers. So we're talking real food, getting back into the community, getting back into the dirt, learning how to shop on the outer aisles, right? eating real food. Um, also recently started what's called the uh, uh, independent Music Collaborative of Central Minnesota. Um, we got a, a lot of uh, uh, legacy dollars uh, from what we all voted on several years ago. Going to a lot of the visual arts, but being a musician, I thought, hey, why don't we get some access to the kids in this area who are amazing, amazing wealth of talent.
talent here, and we can get those kids there. Um, I serve on the, the board of uh, for Wakosa, another nonprofit, um, and it's it's just Minnesota's kind of shining star. I want to make sure we keep it that way. Okay, Mr. Wells. Well, to me, nonprofits are the ultimate safety net. Uh, they fill in the cracks that kind of go left unfilled. Uh, and I'm going to relate specifically to two extremely diverse nonprofits. The first one is very near and dear to my heart. It's called W2C. W2C is an organization that brings together people who are working with veterans, people who are working with active military, and bringing them and transitioning them back into civilian life. Now, there are a lot of those people that fall through the cracks, either with the VA or with other uh, activities into trying to regain their, their stature within the, within the uh, civilian life. So this is an example of where a nonprofit is what I call a safety net. There's a second kind of safety net, and that is there are certain things that give our, make our lives richer, that give us a better quality of life. The arts are an example. And I happen to actually have a stepson who is benefiting from a nonprofit. He works for and actually sings with the Minnesota Opera. Without the nonprofit status, that, would, that opera would not be able to be brought to the general public. The cost would be so high that they would not be able to stay in business. So I support nonprofits. And uh, just uh, finally, I think we have a fine example of what a nonprofit can be in the in uh, center care in, the, uh, in our hospital here. A fine organization contributes to the community in many ways. Okay, now uh, Mr. Walmart. Well, nonprofits have an immense value to our community and to our state. Um, over the years, through work and through our involvement in church, uh, Nicole and I have had the chance to to work for and work with uh, several phenomenal nonprofits in our community. And absolutely, they, uh, they fill needs uh, that the legislature can't, um, from you know, poverty to uh, welcoming people to our community, welcoming people to our country, um, senior issues. There are, the list goes on and on of, of needs that nonprofits fill. And absolutely, we have to do everything that we can um, as a legislature to support those nonprofits, um, be it through grants, be it through eliminating any red tape that might get in their way of, of uh, fulfilling the, their mission and their needs. So absolutely, I'm very committed to uh, uh, working together with anyone at this table to make sure that we are giving the utmost support to our nonprofits and the amazing, amazing needs that they fill in our community. Mr. Knobloch. Well, thank you. Uh, some of you here probably know my mom, Vivian Knobloch. And uh, my mom uh, was uh, the quintessential volunteer for much of her life. As I grew up, I saw her volunteer at our church and in other organizations. And I think I picked up from her that uh, idea of giving back to the community and, and volunteering. And so I've been involved in a lot of nonprofits over the years. Uh, both as a uh, regular member and as a uh, board member of those nonprofits. I'm on the Boy Scout board here in town. I've been on the Boy Scout board for 20 some years. I uh, have uh, been on the St. Cloud Christian School Board, the St. John's University Board of Regents. Uh, I'm in Rotary. Uh, and one of the boards that I'm particularly involved in is the Salvation Army. I've been on that board for, I'd say, at least 15 years. and. I, I guess I've always had a lot of concern about the sort of people the Salvation Army serves that are down on their luck, that are homeless, that are in really difficult circumstances. And my wife and I actually hold a fundraiser for them at our home every fall. Uh, we just had it uh, last week and raised over $40,000 for them this year. And so this, you know, this, the nonprofit community is a really important part of our community, really important part of our state. Legislatively, however, we do see things happen that threaten our nonprofit community. We see bills introduced to get rid of the tax deduction that nonprofits enjoy. We see bills introduced that say, well, now nonprofits are going to have to pay property tax on all their real estate. Uh, those are things I've consistently opposed and will continue to oppose because I think we need a vibrant nonprofit sector. Okay, 
Okay, we'll end this question with Mr. Zilberg. You can tell me if I'm wrong, but I do think it's a tragedy to call nonprofits a safety net. It shouldn't be a safety net. If we were doing our job and had less politicians and more civil servants, we wouldn't need the safety net. That's the first thing. The second thing is, if you look at Crossroads, the tragedy that happened there, the moment after we had Muslims, we had Jews, Christians, all from nonprofits, come together and say, we're united, we're together, we're St. Cloud. That's the perfect image of what a nonprofit should be, wherever they come from. And so that's what I think this table has been missing a little bit. And the second thing is that nonprofits should go to places that, well, that politicians refuse to go to for some reason, uh, such as if you look at St. Cloud State University, there's a women's center which focuses on sexual assault, uh, sex trafficking, uh, just uh, the rape. Overall, politicians, for some reason, aren't talking about that. And in Minnesota, there's tons of it going on. Minnesota is one of the leading states for sex trafficking in the United States. And I haven't seen, I'm sorry, I haven't seen Knobloch speak of that in the, where he is in the, you know, the, the place in the legislation. I haven't seen anyone on this table speak of that. And it's really, really a sad truth when that's not happening. When you have issues like that, and the legislation refuse to answer this. Okay, uh, Mr. Lodblack, would you like to respond to that? Well, since my name was mentioned, I want to very briefly say, if you were listening to my introduction, you, uh, I believe, heard me say that I was the chief house author of the supplemental finance bill that passed this year at the legislature. And one of the things I was proud of that was in it was increased funding to fight sex trafficking. So it is an area that I've been working on. It's an area that I have concerns with. It's an area that I have a record of appropriating money to and fighting. And I think it is a scourge in our state. It is a big problem, and I will continue to fight it. Thank you. OK, so now we're going to go to our next question. With the aging of Minnesotans, what is one reform effort you would like to champion to help older adults and family caregivers? And we're going to start this going right back to Mr. Zilberg. Yep. This is random. I'm not picking on you. No, no problem. <laughs> One of the, what comes first to my mind is actually my grandmother. I visited my, my parents last weekend, and it was the first time in like four years. And uh, my mother had to run out to the emergency room for my grandmother. Uh, and I still I need to find out what went wrong or what's happening. But I think it's a, it's really has to do with a cultural shock and a, a change in us society-wise to where 20, 30, 40 years ago, we respected elders, we cared for, you know, our parents more, grandparents, and so on. And if you look at society today, uh, at least from where, where I sit, uh, the youth don't have the same respect. Families, for some reason, would rather send their parents or grandparents to, you know, a assistant living instead of taking care of them themselves, which your parents took care of you for 50, 60, 70 years, and all you can do is ship them away. To me, that's just, I can't think why I or how I would do that to my parents. And that's what's happening. So I think that's the first area we need to look at. What are our motivations? Uh, are our children going down that path? And what are we teaching our children, period? That they're going to ship us away when we're older, when they're being unthankful, really, because we took care of them since they were young. Uh, the second, third thing, actually, would be the state. What can the state do? Instead of reckless spending, put it where it matters, which is, you know, more places like the Whitney Center in Minnesota. More things that have to do with uh, the issue that we're talking about. Okay, Tamla Tice, next. I'm so happy to talk about this. I'm Vice Chair of Aging and Long-Term Care. And it's a new committee that came about two years ago. Well, actually, last year, in 2015. And we were so excited to actually get $138 million to nursing homes so that we finally put in place a payment system for nursing homes so that they do get the money back in their homes so that they can expand their, um, their, their workforce. One of the things we kept hearing is that they couldn't afford to pay the wages. And 
folks could go to Home Depot, Dairy Queen, and get a better wage than they could in the nursing home. So one of the things, the biggest thing that we did is we uh, really help the nursing homes get the reimbursement. We know that there's more work to do and hopefully we'll get that done in the next coming uh, two years. And that is to, to work with PCAs and get them the funding that they need as well so that, as one man said, please fund them so I don't have to keep training in people to, to help me. And I think a couple people are shaking their head and that's one of the things we hear a lot. So we got the nursing homes taken care of. Now our, our next focus will be PCAs. But also what we're doing is looking at different products and stuff that we can probably help uh, get monies to that'll make folks uh, able to stay in their homes longer. We're also looking at um, phasing out taxation on Social Security. Uh, there's a couple. There were a couple different uh, options on the table. I think we saw about three of them, and uh, there was no appetite to do it in the Senate this year, so we didn't see anything go forward. But I think uh, we're on the cusp of some really good things when it comes to aging and long-term care. Okay, next is Jim Nodlock. Thank you. You know, I think nursing homes play a real important role, and um, certainly I think most people would prefer to uh, not go there unless they have to. But, you know, I think about uh, my wife's family. Um, my father in law had Parkinson's disease, and his wife uh, kept, took care of him at their home for many, many, many years until the day finally came when my father in law actually slipped and fell in the bathtub and couldn't get out. And my mother-in-law, being in her early 80s herself, just didn't have the strength to pull him out. Now, thank goodness there was no water in the tub at the time, but that was the point at which it was really time for him to leave the house and, and go to a nursing home. And uh, we need to make sure that our nursing homes are adequately funded, that uh, that long-term care facility uh, facilities are in place. I was really proud last year in 2015 to play a lead role in the legislation Tamil was talking about, where we put more money in the nursing homes, uh, it is really important. You know, what is something I would really like to do going forward? Uh, there's a campaign called the 5% campaign, now it's the Best Life campaign, to put additional money into the uh, nonprofits, organizations that uh, pay personal care attendants that take care of a lot of elderly, disabled people in their homes. And we had it as part of our bill last year. Uh, the governor, however, uh, didn't have it in his budget. The Senate uh, wouldn't take it. We had another variation of it uh, in our bills this year. Again, the governor didn't have it in his budget. The Senate wouldn't take it. But I think that it is important to do that, and I'll continue to work on doing that if I'm elected. Dan Walkenlund. Well, as we uh, brace as a state for the so-called silver tsunami, when in, in 2020 we will have as many uh, people in our state over the age of 65 as we do children in our schools, uh, we have to take a multifaceted approach to preparing for that. Um, to first answer the question, what can we do um, for the, uh, the increased need of informal caregivers, um, we've got to recognize that there will be uh, more people serving as informal caregivers for their loved ones. And so that's why it's very important that we um, uh, pass paid family leave and realize that uh, more people will need to take time off work to, um, to provide that care. Um, other things that we need to do are uh, support the dementia grant program um, so that um, people who suffer from dementia or Alzheimer's have the resources that they need to be able to, to cope with those um, uh, diseases. Um, and also, I agree with what Tama said about um, making it easier for uh, seniors to be able to stay in their homes. Um, I work as a realtor, and it is devastating when seniors have to move out of their lifelong homes because of the property tax burden. So um, in, in the short term, I certainly support making it easier for seniors to qualify for the Deferred Property Tax Program um, as well as other direct forms of relief. And then in the long term, we've got to increase local government aid uh, back to the 2002 appropriations so that we can lower property taxes for everyone. But um, we've, again, we've got to do everything we can to prepare as a state for the, uh, the changing demographics that face us. Mr. Ralph. Well, I'm going to return a compliment uh, to Mr. Zilberg, and I agree with him on one thing, and that is parental care. By taking care of our families, um, my, uh, my first wife's family, uh, virtually all of the people in that family took care of their, their, their parents 
Um, my uh, sister-in-law stayed with my mother-in-law for almost four years, helping her in her uh, apartment, basically living there uh, most of the time. I think we have to get back to that. Uh, Mr. Zilber is absolutely correct. There was a period of time in our, in our history where that's what we did. And I support that, and I support it in another fashion, and that is I think that what we have to do is look for ways to provide credits to those caregivers. I think that that's important. Another way that I feel we can do something is, is with the nursing homes and the uh, other long-term care providers, I think we do need to, again, provide tax credits Especially where they're hiring people. This is a win-win, folks. We need jobs, and we need good paying jobs. Healthcare is a wonderful place to do that. So I believe that we should look into tax credits for people who, can, who, who increase employment. Uh, there are some other programs that have been used for other areas, and I think this is one we can look at. Uh, the last thing I would say is that the um, Support of the in-home care should be looked at in terms of insurance. I think there's places that we can maybe provide some, some bases whereby that in-home care can be covered by insurance. I believe other choice is one of those. There's some other issues that I think we can use that will help provide a more stable environment for people in their homes rather than having to go into a nursing home. Okay, Eric Putnam. I visited Sterling Commons in Wade Park, Silly Park, uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, and it was a fascinating conversation. I assume that one of the largest issues that was facing that particular home would be staffing ratios. But instead, what the, the executive director told me that was his primary concern was staff turnover. It wasn't so much uh, getting enough staff, it was that people wouldn't continue to work there. And part of the issue was the job was a challenge, but the other thing that fascinated me was that uh, the other issue was that people would go to other homes for higher wage, so that the, the staff and population sort of move around, they have to retrain people. Um, I think the way to get to that particular issue of staffing is to invest more in education and create greater opportunities for people who want to go into this industry to actually have more experiences in those homes and develop greater bonds with those homes, greater senses of loyalty and commitment to those places. So that that hard work that they have to do is work that they're already familiar with. They have a greater relationship with it before they get into the industry in the first place. And another thing, and this is actually fairly personal right now, is that my in-laws are in pretty horrible shape right now. My uh, wife's uh, mother has some serious memory care issues, and her father is non-ambulatory because he spent 20 years as a welder, and his back is completely destroyed. And these situations with my in-laws, what, what concerns me so much about that is the inability to facilitate a whole family decision so that we can't all sit around and talk about what we're supposed to do because of different legal issues and uncertainty. And I think that we need increased counseling and education on those issues too so that we can approach aging as a whole family, whole community concern. Okay, we're going to finish up this question with Zachary Dorhold. I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the original question had to do with uh, what can we do to reduce some uh, regulations in, in regards to in-home care? And um, one of the places where we see a lot of these regulations is zoning codes at the local level, many of which need to be challenged. We need another cultural shift that promotes multi-generational families living together. There's going to be dozens and dozens of huge houses on the market within zones that are restricted to no more than one or two generations with, within a house. Um, we have to have a cultural shift that several of this mentioned here, which is allowing and promoting multiple generations living together. Um, second of all, when it comes to in-home care, that, that's the future. It's got to be the future of care. Um, both my grandfathers fought in World War II, <coughs> moving into a nursing home, the greatest generation. Um, it, we, can't, we can't ever let that happen again. Uh, sometimes we're going to end up there because circumstances, um, physical, we do need that type of intensive care. But if this is about quality care, A, we need to fund the people who do the work, 
which I did when I was a legislator, legislator we gave the 5% and then another one and a half that they were owed to direct care providers. Zero, zero went to these providers last time around. Okay, now we're up to our next question. And victims or survivors or victims and survivors of domestic violence and sex trafficking, including children, often struggle to work through the trauma due to the violence. What role can the legislature play in providing access to trauma-informed mental health care? And Mr. Nonblack, we're going to start with you. Well, that's a, a tough question. I mean, uh, people who are in this situation uh, are, you know, clearly very traumatized sometimes in, in very difficult situations. I mean, I think we as a state, you know, definitely have a role in providing aid to these people, whether it's uh, you know, counseling, uh, certainly whether it's other uh, living situations. Uh, we as a state need to uh, step up as needed for uh, these people that are in this situation. You know, I know that you know, to some extent we have programs already, in some cases transitional housing, uh, some other programs that are available for some people in these areas. The nonprofit community plays a big role right now in uh, helping some of the people that are in these circumstances. Uh, but uh, clearly there are needs here, and I guess I have to say I'm not an expert in this particular area. I, you know, no one's an expert in every area, but uh, if people here have, you know, ideas and uh, thoughts on what else the state should be doing in this particular area since we've got a room full of people here or at least many people are involved in the nonprofit community i'd uh, be very happy to visit with you afterwards and hear about your thoughts on what we as a state can do for them thank you uh zachary dorholt um well this is once again kind of what i do as a living uh for a living um and I would refrain from even calling myself an expert. Um, but I don't know if any of you have heard of the ACEs study. It's, kind of, it's a big deal right now. It stands for Adverse Childhood Events. Um, and for the more adverse events you have, based in Trump, the higher your score, the less likely you are to succeed in the traditional manner in life. Um, the hospital, St. Paul Hospital, has recognized this, and they've taken amazing strides to, to recognize this. The mental health center has done this. Uh, the problem is we don't have enough providers. And me being one of those providers, someone who works, I put it this way, if we could get rid of the significant amount of trauma people experience in their life, whether it's rape, torture, abuse, my client will be cut in half. And I wouldn't mind that at all. The fact is, I'm going to owe a lot of money in student debt. Maybe for the rest of my life. Because that's how much it costs to go to school nowadays. And to get the degree you need in order to provide this quality treatment. So until we start walking the walk and funding people who are willing to work at a nonprofit or a hospital and do this kind of care, we're never going to have the providers. Because I can leave my job at a nonprofit mental health center and make at least twice as much in many different areas of the private sector. Um, but I love my job and I love taking on SPAL. And it's the closest thing to an expert um, in any category I say I am. Dan Walgamont. I'll never forget uh, a few months ago when the St. Cloud Times um, published their. Um, they're a very in-depth story about the issue of sex trafficking here in St. Cloud. Um, I happened to be uh, holding our, our baby daughter, Polly, as I was reading about that. And I wept. It, it made me sick to my stomach that um, women and girls are, are going through that right here in our very community. Um, it was shocking. And uh, it, similar to, to Representative Knobloch, I'm by no means an expert in this issue, but um, I do have a, a passion and a determination to do whatever we can um, in the legislature to prevent that. Um, you know, speaking for our, our former question about the value of nonprofits, 
Um, uh, my wife Nicole has worked at an interpreter, as an interpreter at the Anne Marie's Alliance, and the work that they do for battered and, and abused women is phenomenal. So that's one great example of of nonprofits um, really filling a tremendous need in our community. Um, and, and all throughout all, all sectors of our state, um, we need to make sure that we have good resources in place um, to help uh, people who are experiencing trauma and, and mental health issues. Um, right now in the state of Minnesota, we rank towards the bottom in the amount of uh, counselors that we have in schools, in counselors and counselors and social workers in our schools. Um, that's something that we need to make a priority to recruit. Um, you know, we were uh, just on campus last night and talking with some students about um, ideas, um, you know, affirmative consent laws and uh, different resources at hopefully a newly renovated Eastman Hall to provide health services for students. So um, this is a, a devastating problem in our state and we need to work with nonprofits in our, our education systems and mental health centers to, to alleviate it. Eric Putnam. This is just such a sad and, and tragic issue. Um, and the unfortunate thing is that, sure, there was this article in the St. Cloud Times about it a couple weeks ago, but we can't kid ourselves into thinking it wasn't happening before that occurred. What I think we face with issues of mental health more generally, and especially with issues of mitigating trauma, is the notion of stigma that surrounds mental illness, that discourages people from actually seeking the help that they need, in addition to having it being available. So from my perspective, we need to find ways to reduce the stigma around mental health more generally, and to think about post-traumatic stress disorder in lots of different circumstances. You know, I, I uh, met with the police chief in St. Joe uh, a while back, uh, he's a friend, and he talked to me a little bit about the lack of PTSD training for police officers being a significant issue that we need to address as well. And again, that's just another component of how we don't take mental illness as seriously as I think we ought to. And I agree with Dan's diagnosis, because I think one of the places where we actually see it occur is in schools. The schools provide a special place for us to notice and ameliorate the problems that, uh, like trauma. Because uh, things like this, these issues, they can appear in schools in ways that you wouldn't see in other places. Molly Flory was a, a school counselor for a very long time before she became an administrator. And that story she tells me are absolutely heartbreaking. But the other half of that is, as Dan suggested, years ago we had lots of counselors in the schools and now we don't. And now our counselors are test administrators instead of mental health, prov not providers, but people who can, can uh, uh, deal with uh, young people's mental health. So that would be my answer. Okay, Tamatize. This is a hard subject to talk about, and it's a hard subject to talk about in the legislature too. Um, and again, as folks are talking, you kind of get refreshed about some of the things we did. And one of the things that we have been doing in legislature is knowing we have to do a better job with what we're doing. Number one, victims are victims. We're picking up the, actually children and women or men who are um, out there soliciting and we're holding them as the, the bad guy. And what we're finding out is that we really have a lot of work to do in making sure that those victims are taken care of. And there are um, grants out there. We did put some, uh, we did put the grant money out there and nonprofits do have to uh, do the, go through the grant writing process to get those. And I know that Catholic Charities and the Children's Home is reaching out, but what's really nice is we're seeing some opportunities where, where folks are creating um, safe places for folks to go to so that they get the counseling they need we're finally seeing that, you know, who we really have to, to really help. And again, I will echo, um, I'm a big advocate as counselors in schools. I think we really miss the boat when we don't have them there for many reasons. Um, it's a great place to start. But I think what we really need to do is, is to really be that advocate and keep bringing it up that this isn't going away. It's a big problem in Way Park. We've seen it. Um, I know the hospital, Central Care has been stepping up and doing some programs where they're finding health care that better suits needs for folks who are uh, going through some mental health issues. Jerry Ralph. Well, there's two issues here. And I'm going to speak to the one that I'm most familiar with, and that is domestic abuse. For almost 10 years, I was part of the Anna Marie's Alliance. I was on their board. I was there when they helped build and helped them build the new shelter. 
Um, and I'm glad to hear that they're expanding their facilities, which I support. The issue of domestic abuse centers around understanding and education. It is a cycle that needs to be broken. And places like Anna Marie's counselors, they are the ones that are most important in breaking that cycle of abuse. So I support, strongly support that sort of organization. The second half of this is the, is the discussion about the actual sex trafficking and of sexual assaults. Again, we, we've talked about stigmas and we've talked about labels. One of the things that we need to do is educate the rest of the community. This holds for both domestic abuse and sexual abuse. We have to understand what's going on here. And I, I, I agree that we need counselors uh, to help people who have been made victims. We need to help the victims themselves. This is a great trauma. In many cases, they're ashamed to come forward. We need to educate them and help them and support them. And I support any program that moves that agenda forward. Steven Silver. It's a very complex situation. Uh, part of it is because of the criminalization and the criminal system, as well as the personal uh, toll it takes on trauma and the victim. Uh, I'm in a sexual advocacy training program, which means I'm almost done with it. Afterwards, I'll be working in hotlines and organizations to help through trauma and so on. What you learn is that, especially in Minnesota, you'll see someone who was you know, guilty of rape, and they'll get out sooner from jail or prison than someone, let's say, who was charged with carrying a thing of weed or uh, heavy narcotics. Now, that rape or sexual assault lives with the person who's the victim their entire life. And when that person gets out of jail, they're gonna, you know, cause havoc upon the person who has the trauma. So how's that person getting out sooner than someone who, sure, maybe they did meth or coke, but they should be in rehab, not jail. So it has to do with criminalization as well. Uh, the other uh, you know, problem is reforming the system at the legislator as well as money. Uh, I don't think that organizations should have to apply and then have that application be approved by the legislation. They should automatically be given money without having to write up some kind of, please give me this money because of X, Y, and Z. It gives legislation another way of controlling the state and the organizations that are doing the help on the grounds. Okay, and now I think we have our last question. Uh, what would be your highest priorities as a legislator, and how would you accomplish them? And we're going to start this one with Dan Walgamont. My top priority in the legislature um, is making sure that everybody has a great opportunity to contribute to our economy, and that starts with a world-class education. Uh, at all levels, we need to make sure that we are investing in our most valuable natural resource, our students. Uh, I'm a strong supporter of uh, increased uh, uh, access in affordable uh, early childhood education. Um, Right now, only 15% of four-year-olds attend a public preschool. That ranks us among the lowest in the country. And it's no surprise then that uh, approximately 40 to 50% of kids in kindergarten aren't ready for kindergarten. So right away, our, our youngest learners are at a, a comparative educational disadvantage with their peers. Um, I'm a, a big, uh, strong supporter of uh, adequate increased investment in K-12. Um, schools are uh, the recent Senate bill. Uh, we had a strong investment in that, um, and I would continue to support such investments. And we've got to make sure that we're investing in our institutions of higher education, our um, colleges and universities and community colleges. Um, we've got to make sure that uh, college tuition is affordable. Right now, the uh, average student uh, graduates uh, from a, a university or college in Minnesota with an average of $30,000 in debt. Um, and that's average. And if we uh, don't make that a priority, we're going to lose out to other states that do. And we want to make sure that we have a, a highly educated, highly skilled workforce. So my uh, top priority, my passion is uh, making sure we have a great education system here in Minnesota. Okay, Steven Zilberg. The highest priority 
It's difficult because all of them are a priority for me. I don't find one that weighs more than the other. We should be focusing on all of them instead of saying, well, this one deserves more attention. No, they all deserve attention. And the reason why I want to go to the Capitol Hill is because I'm not there as a politician. I'm not there to say, well, you know, if you guys give me more money or can, you know, you know, persuade me, then I'll do your cause and this cause, you guys are second. That's not why I'm there. And because of that, I think that's why I'm probably, and I know for sure I'm best qualified to get the vote, period, because I'm not there for a party, I'm there for you, and not some organization telling me what to say. Also, if you look systematically, I think the biggest priority, if you want to give it a generalized term, systematic. Uh, over 90% of Social Security and food stamps in Minnesota go to wealthy, often white families. Uh, 144 Minnesotans have been shot and killed by police. I think just last week there was uh, an individual shot and killed by police in Lane uh, or Anoka, one of those places. And so it's happening in Minnesota as well, not just in Chicago, Detroit, uh, you know, wherever you think of, it's happening right here in our backyard. Yet there's not a lot of people talking about it in Minnesota. Uh, the only thing they think of is Black Lives Matter, but that's a whole other topic. And so that's why I'm doing this, rather than a big organization behind me. Eric Putnam. I think there's a pretty good chance that a lot of us are going to say education, so I'll say education. But it actually is also because that's my life, that's my career, that's my wife's career. Education is our thing. But more importantly, I think that education is the key to renewing our civic culture. We need to think about education not just as an opportunity to invest more money, but as a way of reconfiguring or thinking about what it means to be a member of a public community. And for that reason, I think we need to lower the walls between higher education and public schools. We need to lower the walls between nonprofits and public schools and create bridges and connections between these, these organizations so that our schools can actually truly grow citizenship. I can think of really specific policies that I'd like to adopt and initiatives I'd like to do, but I've already started doing that. I'm already going to the schools and talking about politics. I'm already doing pedagogy instruction for 742. For the past five years, I've been doing that, teaching teachers how to talk about citizenship in their schools. I was the uh, entire professional development program for the Sartell Public Schools. Uh, I, I did what I did for 742 for free, but I charged Sartell. <laughs> That's how I think we need to, to, to invest more money in the schools, but we also need to think about them differently. We need, to, we need to stop the flight from our schools and make our schools a place that students run to rather than run from. We lost 1,600 students that opened enrollment to other districts last, last year. 25 to 35% of parochial schools. That's a tremendous amount, not just of resources, but of community that's leaving our schools. So for me, fundamentally, my priority will be Education is a way of renewing our civic culture. Jim Nodler. Well, ph philosophically, I guess I would say that public safety and the administration of justice uh, are sort of always the first duty of government. I mean, education is really important, but if your child has to worry about being beaten up when they go to school, there's not going to be a lot of learning that takes place. Uh, transportation is important, but if you have to worry about your car being carjacked as uh, you're uh, doing your driving around, well, you know, the transportation system isn't going to work real well. If you have to worry about being shot uh, when you're out uh, doing uh, your errands or going to higher education, obviously things are uh, not going to work very well in those areas. But in terms of my own personal priorities, uh, if I'm re-elected, I would guess that I would like to be back in the position that I've had the last two years of chair of the Ways and Means Committee, which is basically the budget committee for the Minnesota House. Uh, this last year, uh, kind of the three areas that weren't part of the budget bill, uh, transportation, bonding, and the tax bill, uh, didn't get done. Uh, fortunately, I was able to, as the uh, House author of the budget bill, uh, get funding in for all the other areas. And so it's a it's a process for me chairing that committee of looking at all the different needs out there and seeing, well, you know, how much do we think we need to put into E12 education versus higher education versus public safety and balancing all those needs. And uh, while I was very busy on that budget issue the last couple uh, weeks of the session in particular, 
wasn't involved in the other areas that much, I really would like to see us get a uh, bigger and better transportation bill than the one we did pass, pass as well as another bonding bill and tax bill. Secretary Dorbold. Oh, priorities are hard to measure. Uh, bottom line, always. Every single time I look at a bill, the priority will be the people and the lives attached to the words or numbers on that piece of legislation. The priority is people. Step it up one more. The priority is, is our community, St. Cloud area. Um, I think we've done a tremendous job here recently uh, moving forward through some, some tough times. And we should be thankful of, I think, uh, we mentioned law enforcement here, having to be endorsed by the Minnesota Police and Peace Officers Association. I work with our local police um, on crisis response uh, with folks who do have mental illness. Um, which brings me back, of course, to healthcare being a priority. We can save a lot of money in healthcare if we start focusing on the health care, making sure that people who do and provide the care can do what they need without having to fill out 30 different forms for several different insurance companies. Um, and another priority, I think, that we, we didn't come up with any questions, we've had great questions today, um, is the environment. We're, we're the headwaters of Mississippi here. Uh, water is going to be a significant, significant part of the conversation as we move forward for my two-year-old and four-year-old. And I want to make sure our 10,000 lakes and go up to the boundary waters, we can you know, drink that water and not have to worry about being toxic afterwards. Okay, Tamba Tice. It's really hard to separate one as a priority because to me they all work together in that my biggest priority is my community. And what my community needs and what they come to me for is what my priority is at that time. So. Looking at that, to me, education, healthcare, um, we've got a wonderful diverse area where education is huge. I mean, we have a lot of educational facilities here. We have a lot of healthcare here. We have a lot of manufacturing here. We just have a lot of stuff going on here. So to pick just one area is really difficult. What we find is uh, there are times when I'm on uh, commerce, I'm on uh, aging long-term care, bonding, and government operations and elections. There are times I'm doing something that's completely out of my box because that's what somebody needs me to do for my community. So when I look at really what a day should look like, it's never the same. And it's never the same because the needs are never the same for everybody. And no need is really too small to look at. We have to do everything. So when I agree to take legislation, some, sometimes it's really uncomfortable. It's not something I would ordinarily do. But then somebody comes to you and you say, yeah, man, this is really, really what I love to do. And you're really grateful to be able to do that for everyone. Because I want everyone to feel like they really matter. And I think the best job we all do is to make our communities our priority. And I think you kind of heard that. It is our priority. What we do is all about what happens here. Thank you. And our last answer for this question, Jerry Ralph. My priority. First of all, my priority is to listen. That is to listen to the residents of the community. Find out what their priorities are. That is the primary purpose. There's only one senator for the whole, whole district. So I have to represent people on both sides. So in doing that, when I've been out door knocking and talking to people, I think education is important. I think jobs are important. I think Tamara was very right when she said they all relate. I think if we have good schools, we will have a way to produce people with skill sets that will be able to get jobs or to go on to get higher education to learn to carry on jobs. I'm a firm believer in the technical, vocational technical uh, education system. My wife teaches in it. Um, we need to expand the programs that get children exposed to the business community. We're starting to do that, and I think there's some more initiatives to try and get set up in eighth graders to be able to be exposed. 
to various things. Let them go out to the boot shack and, and sell boots. Maybe they like retail. Or let them, go to the, let them go to the factory for a while and pull a turret lathe. Let them be exposed to that because by the time they're in high school, it's almost too late. So they get, they get the chance then. We support these vocational programs and we support a broad education system. But it still comes back to one thing. We need our kindergarten from 12th grades to teach our kids the basics. We have to get back to reading, writing, and arithmetic. And I think that that's an important goal that I would look for, to try and give the school boards the tools to be able to make sure that we close the achievement gap and have kids that graduate from high school prepared to go into the end of the world and make a living. Okay, we have reached the end of our time for our questions. And we'll begin closing statements. And we're going to do those in random order again. Just I'm going to my next column. And the first is Eric Putnam. One minute for a closing statement. Excuse me. She was serious. When she said that. <laughs> I got my gap. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I got a pretty good job already. Uh, and so uh, when I think about why I'm doing this, why I'm doing the work to, to run for office, it's uh, it started as a curiosity, but it developed into a passion. I remember two years ago, I first considered the prospect of it because I teach about political discourse and I could go directly from the mailbox to my classroom. And I would take all the mailers that I got and I'd give them to 20 year olds and they would say, this is killing us. Not all of the mailers, but the negativity of the mailers is the problem. Now what I teach is about citizenship. And that's what I want to do. That's my goal. And I, I bring to the office a set of skills that will make me more independent. I think that Stephen's correct when he says a lot of people are dependent on their parties. I don't see parties as identity, I see a party as a tool to solve a problem. If the DFL were to send me talking points, I would correct them, grade them, and send them back. <laughs> I don't need someone else to write a letter for me to publish in the St. Cloud Times. I'll do it myself. I'm not dependent on a party for anything. And I reject the tribalism, the adolescent tribalism that happens in the legislature right now, and that's why I ask for your support. Okay, now Jerry Rill. As the owner of Lake Master Lake Maps, a small business that I started along with a friend of mine, I learned what it is to create jobs. I learned what it takes to build a business. I learned that you need skilled people to be able to fill the jobs. I know what it is to pursue the American dream. I have three grandchildren and expect a few more. I want them to have the same opportunities that I did. I have the maturity, the life experience, the education, and the, and the desire to represent this community and to, to do good things for it. I want to bring a clear, rational voice to St. Paul to represent this community. And I would appreciate your vote in November. Thank you. Jim Novak. Well, thank you. Uh, the political, the St. Paul Pioneer Press named me as having the most independent uh, voting record of any Republican in the legislature these last two years. Uh, what does that mean? It means I'm someone who's willing to stand up for my community. It means I'm someone who's willing to say no to my political party if I think they're going the wrong way. And I have on many occasions. And in fact, some of you may know that I offered a bill to get rid of political party designations in the legislature. I think we, used to go, we should go back the way it used to be where you ran for the legislature just like you run for city council or county commissioner or school board without being tied to a political party. Uh, but I've shown uh, with my record in the legislature that I'm someone that works with both sides. I think that Republicans, Democrats, Libertarians, Independents, and others have good ideas that all should be brought forward and uh, worked out to have the best solution that we possibly can for our community. As uh, the Chair of the Ways and Means this Committee this last year, I was the chief author, as I mentioned, of the budget bill that passed that had a lot of things for our community. One and a half million dollars of additional early childhood funding for District 742. Uh, getting rid of the state income tax on veterans' military retirement. Uh, money for the St. Paul Human Rights Office, and I could go on. I think I've shown that I'm effective, and I appreciate it. Thank you. 
Thank you. Tim and Tice. I love working with people, and that's probably one of the reasons why I ran for office in the first place. Uh, I grew up knowing that you don't just take your community for granted, that you give back. And so when Greg and I got married and had our businesses and, and moved here to St. Cloud, we always felt the same way. We were always involved in school, churches, you know, so many different things. And I love giving that back to people. I love working with people. I don't care which side of the aisle you're on. I don't care a lot of different things. It's just very, it's rewarding because the, the uh, education that I got just being in the legislature is just amazing. I've never learned like this before. I've never learned this fast. I've never done anything like this. And it is absolutely a joy. There are days, you know, you look at yourself and go, what was I thinking? And the next morning you get up and you think, yeah, that's right. That's why I'm here. I love my job. I love giving back. So thank you, and I hope that you send me back again. Thank you. Steven Zilberg. To have someone on Capitol Hill that wants Minnesota a place for everyone, regardless of gender, race, nationality, religion, to make it so St. Cloud, it's the best place for whether it's a Somali American, a, you know, Middle Eastern individual, for me, that's the whole goal of making St. Cloud as beautiful as it is. We shouldn't be focusing on, you know, things that only will affect one group of people. As someone on Capitol Hill, the whole point I'm there is to make it so the legislative bills that come up improve the life for everyone, not just the middle income individuals, for wealthy individuals. It should be good for everyone, regardless of where they are, what color they are, or what economic standing they are. And that's who you should vote for, really, if that person can make that happen. And that's why I hope you vote, and you vote based on who you think is best and not your affiliation for a party. Dan Walgamont. I think most of us up here at these tables and uh, in here in the audience this afternoon are, are very frustrated with uh, the gridlock and the partisan games and the bickering and the procrastinating that goes on. And uh, I've, I've found in my experience that the best way to remedy that is by strong relationships between legislators and constituents. And I'm very proud of the fact that uh, since I've started my campaign, I've had over 3,000 conversations with voters at their doors. Um, I've seen a lot of faces of folks that I got to meet at, their, at your door, and it's exciting to, to get to follow up again. But um, I'm running for the Senate because I want to bring a fresh and accountable and hardworking perspective to represent us. We've got a large, diverse community, and I've got the energy and the experience in bringing people together and getting things done to, uh, to go to St. Paul and, and work together with, I work with anyone up here at this table. I know that no party is 100% right on 100% of the ideas, and ultimately I'm running to be accountable to you. So uh, again, thank you so much to the League for putting on this forum this afternoon, and thanks to all in attendance, and if you live in District 14, I respectfully ask for your vote. Zachary uh, Dorval. Thanks again for coming out today. I forgot to mention it. I'm also a small business owner. I, I forget that. Um, I'm part owner of the Old Capital Tavern. Um, you know, we went first place in six categories of the best in the city. Um, so, <laughs> well, that was the other one, I forget that. Uh, so on one hand, I, I understand exactly what it's like to deal with uh, regulations and, business, and burdens put on businesses. I mean, we serve alcohol, they're one of the most highly regulated industries in the state. On the other hand, I work with people who do not have access same type of access that you and I have um, to various aspects in our community or through legislation otherwise. And bringing both of those back to, to St. Paul um, is, is very important to me. Um, when I was there, we, we did a lot. Uh, they didn't pass the transportation bill this past couple years. When I was there, I actually offered a bill and became part of the, okay, you see it did. But I got a few miles down I-94. We talk about that. And we got things done when I was there. I'd, I'd like to, to get back to doing that and bring that balance back to St. Paul. Okay, thank you. Now I have um, 
more stuff that I have to read. These is required reading. So thank you, audience members, for asking questions and for your cooperation. And thank you to each of the candidates.